This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, episode 382, part two. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everyone? It's Brandon Turner, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with a follow up second half to yesterday's show with my co host, Mr. David Green. David, welcome to the podcast again, man. What's going on? Thanks, Brandon. It's been awesome. I, I sold a flip that I was working on with a partner. We did pretty good on that. Each of us made money. And then last week, I put three buyer clients under contract, all house hackers, Fancy. and two listings under contract, both over asking price. So, Barrier real estate is still trekking along in the midst of this pandemic. Yeah, it's it's moving along. Uh, can I can I read something? This is not about me. This is about somebody else. But I wanted to read the story. I put it on my Instagram because I thought it was such a cool story. Somebody sent me a message on Instagram, and it said this. It said, "This is nothing to do with what you just said." I just want to make sure we read this. This is my quick tip for today. So. Uh, Ian T. Vard, I'm hoping saying that said, when I started in, in real estate, I hoped I could do what Beardy Brandon did for his daughter to buy the small multifamily unit as a kid's college fund. End of February 2020, I bought a fourplex for 44 grand with zero down. So that's a cool story in itself. One unit was vacant, needed massive rehab. I turned a one bedroom into a three bedroom, rented it a week ago. The rest of the units need small rehab. Um, uh, today, my son was born. Even in the current climate, he starts his life with more advantages than he had ever had, and I had quite a few. Anything in life is possible if you believe in yourself and relentlessly pursue it. Despite all the houses we've had and the projects we've done, this is the most special. So rest up, little guy. You have a family that loves you more than anything in the world, uh, a world of limitless possibilities and an amazing adventure to come. Uh, you also have a lot of painting and some yard work, but you'll uh, until you're ready, I'll look after that for you. Anyway, I love that story because it, it it just showcases what, like, Real estate's really about like it's not about like you just swimming in piles of coins like Scrooge McDuck. It's like this is generational wealth. This is future. This is our kids and our grandkids. Uh, this is about having a more abundant and successful life. And so my quick tip for today, our quick tip, hey, tip. is don't let fear of the current world, what we're going through, take you out of the game. Don't let it stop you, slow you down, because you've got a strong reason for getting there. So I just want to encourage you all with that is, is remember your reason. Why are you doing this? And uh, hold tight to that in tough times. And tough times are what today's show is really all about. You know what I really love about that story that you just shared before we get into the, the interview? The Instagram one? Yeah, your Instagram yeah. story. Is that it highlights the power of a big why. We refer in real estate to your big why as the main thing that motivates you. And you will find that when you start off with real estate investing, most people in general want to build wealth. And the majority of them, I would say, is to get out of their day job. They just want a better life. They want more money and they know this can get them out. And you will hit that point where you will make enough money through real estate to replace your income and you quit your job. And a lot of people just get into this kind of no man's land. They're like, I don't really know if I really want to do this. They lose motivation and then you actually become unhappy. You can be very, very wealthy and not happy with your life when you're not making progress. And Tapping into your big why is really one of the ways to make sure that you are always content and satisfied with life. So Brandon knows his big why is his daughter Rosie and his new son Wilder and his wife Heather. And everything he does that he doesn't want to do, he thinks about them when he's doing it and it gets him through it. I kind of shifted my big why to helping my clients build wealth. So I don't have a family, but I'm not investing in real estate as much anymore because I get a kick out of helping other people to build wealth for themselves. And house hacking is one way to do that. Uh, just owning property itself is a huge way to, to build wealth instead of renting. And this person on the Instagram story shared that he bought a house, I think it was $44,000, no money down. That tells me that there's a lot of elbow grease going into this deal. And most of us don't like elbow grease. But when you're thinking, I'm doing this for my son so that someday his college will be paid for, he will, under, he will be wealthy, whatever the case may be, that work doesn't suck. And you're way more likely to go do it. You're way more likely to go take action when you tie it to an emotion that matters to you. And that's what's brilliant about that story is they've tied this into their big why. And that's really our superpower. All of us would be amazed what we can accomplish when we're motivated enough. And the key to what successful people do is they find that motivation and they tie it to whatever their goals are. I don't know if anyone does that better than Brandon that I've met. And that's probably why you chose that story because you recognize, oh, this is powerful. It is powerful stuff. But yeah, it's uh, it, it's super cool. So thanks, man. Uh, so speaking of motivation, you know, and I said in the quick tip, obviously, like, you know, you, you got to stick through that 
your why because again you're you're going to run into tough times today's we're bringing back josiah so josiah smelzer i hope i'm saying his last name right i know i struggled with that last time and i'm horrible with names in general so josiah is a buddy of mine and josiah we brought him on the show we recorded a couple months ago this episode with him and josiah uh a lot changed in the past two months obviously with the whole covid thing going on and the lockdown and the economy and everything changing and so his strategy which was super cool uh, ran into some difficult difficulties. In general, just the Burr strategy is running into some difficulties right now. And I've been having a lot of people say, well, this is why the Burr strategy doesn't work or this is why you shouldn't do it. And I know David wrote a book on it and I've had, I know you've had the same comments on your Instagram and, and messages from people. This, is a gr- this whole show is dedicated to how to still make Burr work, why it still works, uh, how to do low and no money down, even in this kind of a market, and why even when tough times come, how to get through them. And Josiah goes through his exact story of what he did over the past two months, uh, and just like, he, the, you know, the crap hits the fan over and over and over for him. Uh, but he explains how he how he uh, fought through, and you guys are going to love this story. So anything you want to add to that before I jump in, David? No, I think people are going to love this. This is the first time we've really ever done it where we aired a person's interview and then we came back in the very next episode as well. This is what happens when everything goes wrong. So I yeah. thought that was a super cool way of showing people the the full story. But you learn way more about yourself and real estate in general when you look at what happens when things go wrong instead of just always hearing what goes right. Such a good point. I'll take an Instagram clip right oh, there. Oh, Brandon also comes up with a great analogy. I was very proud. It was like watching my, my child ride their bike for the first time. I okay, well, really good. so I did. And then Kevin, our producer, tells me, he sends me a message saying, actually, Jay Scott had that exact same uh, uh, analogy on a recent episode of some, some video he did, which I did not watch. But apparently, I used his analogy, and I thought I was pretty clever. Whatever. It's okay. Let's, uh, let's get on with this. I'm sure. <laughs> Let's get on with this. This is part two of our episode with Josiah Smeltzer. Josiah, man, welcome back to the Bigger Pockets podcast. It's been a whole 24 hours since you were on the show. <laughs> man, it's great to be back, even though the first one hadn't aired yet. Yeah, I know. Crazy. All right. So here's the deal, guys, that we mentioned in the introduction. Uh, we're bringing Josiah back on today's show because the pre-COVID and post-COVID there is a change that happened. We want to update you guys. And really, today's show is all about Burr investing and what works and what doesn't work in today's world. We want to kind of wrap that within Josiah's story. So maybe we'll just start at the beginning. Josiah, first of all, just in case somebody didn't listen to your your episode, which they should go back and listen to yesterday's episode, 382 part one. But if they didn't, and they're not going to because they're stubborn like David Green here, tell us your story. To summarize episode one and kind of get us into this this episode on the Burr strategy during, you know, COVID-19 and I guess during difficult times, this would also apply, but we we basically tried to step on the gas and build a portfolio of $4 million worth of investment properties in about two years. And we, we did this by finding private money and hard money and layering private money in on top of the hard money to buy distressed properties, to get those properties renovated, then to use the Burr strategy, refi, get our our hard money and private money loans paid off, and hopefully be in the property for 75% loan to value or less with no money out of pocket. That, in a perfect world, is the perfect Burr. So let's just say, so so people are clear. Yeah, let's just say a hundred thousand dollar property. It's worth a hundred thousand ARV. So when it's all fixed up, it's worth a hundred grand. What mm-hmm. is those like? How much are you borrowing from hard money? How much is private money? Yeah. Like what? What would a hypothetical hundred thousand dollar deal look like? What we're shooting for is to be all in on that property for seventy five or eighty thousand or less, depending on the loan to value requirements on your refinance. So the lender we were working with had an 80% loan to value requirement on the refinance. So we would say, we want to be all in on this. And we're talking holding cost, closing cost, everything at $80,000 $80, on this $100,000 property. And so we would back into our numbers. We would say, okay, we can get this for 50. If, if there's going to be, you know, 20,000 repairs, that would put us at 70. And then holding costs and closing costs is another 10 that gets us to 80. So our hard money lender would say, okay, we'll lend you 90% of that 80. So 72,000. And then the private money would lend us the other 10%, which would be the 8,000. And, and, and then we would do draws and, and be reimbursed for that. And in theory, that's going to cover 
buying and renovating the property and then getting the property refinanced. And so to make a long story short, we had 10 properties completed and had refinanced those over to Fannie Mae. We did that successfully. That was pre-COVID-19, pre-anarchy of all this pandemic stuff. We had 10 more properties in the pipeline. And when I said we stepped on the gas, we said we're going to do a lot more of these at the same time to try to speed this up. We had five that were completely renovated and rented. And they were going through the refinance process with our lender. When the COVID-19 thing hit, I'm, I'm talking like, the lender had already told us you're approved to close your refinances, 80% loan to value. And on these properties, we only had to bring $25,000 to the table to close it. So that's like five, five grand a property. It was five properties. That's a successful burr in my opinion. These are high quality properties in Fort Worth, Texas, B class. The closing costs alone are about five to $7,000 a property. So we're talking about, we made our 80% goal. We're just paying out of pocket for the closing costs. We were happy with that. Okay, let me jump in real quick here. Let me make sure that I understand what you're saying. So you bought 10 properties. Is that right? Yeah, we got, we have 20 total properties. 10 were already, already refinanced over to Fannie Mae with this whole process already, already taken care of. We've got 10 in the pipeline now. So with those first 10, you borrowed money from a a hard money lender to buy the property and finance part of the rehab. You borrowed the remaining money from private lenders probably for the rehab portion. So you have these short-term loans that are more expensive, but the goal is to get the properties worth more using this more expensive money and then refinance out of that expensive money into cheaper money in what you described as a Fannie Mae Freddie Mac loan. Is that correct? That's that's correct. And you did this successfully with 10 properties, either all at the same time or one after another, but some yes. combination of this method of I buy properties and I uh, fix them up and then I refinance them. You were doing this again with a second group of properties. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of that, fixing houses up and then planning to go refinance them, COVID-19 hit. And it basically threw a huge wrench in all your plans because lending standards changed and the world just kind of froze. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. Okay, awesome. Go ahead and jump back in. Yeah, yeah. And, And the first thing that happened that was like, what's going on here? The lender that had approved the five, we had the five. So we had the 10 that are already on Fannie, Fannie Mae. Those are taken care of. We've got 10 more, five are renovated and rented, ready to refinance, and five are being renovated. So we've got 20 total, 10 are in this refi process. Five are ready to refi. The lender, we we had gotten those appraised, we were ready to close, we got approval to close those five. All we had to bring was $25,000 to the table to close. The terms on that were, I I took some notes here so I make sure I don't leave any of this out. The terms were 5.5% on a 30 year fixed. So not the cheapest interest rate, but we've, we're also at 80% loan to value, which d- doesn't require us to bring as much to the table to close. That lender, after the coronavirus stuff happened and the market start, started having some trouble, that lender said, we don't want to close these loans. So I'm like, well, we've been approved. You know, They didn't want to close. And you may be saying, why would they not want to close these loans? And I'll tell you what they said. What are your thoughts? Why, why would why would you think a lender in this situation wouldn't want to close these? One reason could be that they don't want to put their capital out in a loan because they're not sure if distressed assets are going to come out. They're going to want to lend on those. Another would be they're worried that you're an investor. And if you can't get a renter because the world stopped, you won't be able to make the payment and they'll have to foreclose right after they give you the loan. Another reason could be that maybe they were planning on selling those notes in the secondary market. And now they can't go sell it in the secondary market because the secondary market is frozen because the mortgage-backed security market is panicking. That's, That's I mean. it. That's it. Okay. You nailed it. The secondary market issue was the was the main issue, and then and then a layer on top of that was they were worried that the tenants were going to stop paying. They would have to foreclose on these things, and they'd have a bunch of properties where there's no income coming in with tenants living in them that they can't evict these tenants right because there's stuff about you can't get tenants out of these properties that you got to give them you know, X number of months in the property during the, so, so yeah, the reason that they did not want to close these, even though they had approved us was they were worried they were going to get these five properties, package them up, try to sell them off on the secondary market and nobody was going to buy them. And then they were going to be caught holding the bag, trying to collect money from tenants that won't pay from owners that don't have money to pay them. And then they're going to be in a bind. So they, they didn't want to take that risk. So they came back to us and said, we're not going to close your loans. So we're like, okay, great. That was our plan. Our plan all along has been to refinance these at this 80% loan to value rate with these guys. We had been approved. We're like, you know, the first thing I think of is 
Well, now we're going to have to try to go through Fannie Mae. Well, we already had 10 properties through Fannie Mae. I already had 10 properties. And so I'm like, okay, we're going to have to get creative with this. And by the way, the worst time to refinance properties through Fannie Mae is going to be during a pandemic when when they're raising raising capital requirements to close, being extra careful on all the loans they're making. And so I'm like, great. This and, and then on top of that, people are putting their properties up for sale because they're now concerned about, you know, being able to to get tenants or flip or whatever they're doing. There's more properties hitting the market, which is driving is is driving values down temporarily, maybe even slightly. So I was automatically concerned being an appraiser, the appraisal values on these stand a stand a chance of coming in a little bit lower than they did before temporarily. And so, and then, okay. And then here's another layer. Okay. So I've, we've got this problem of, we can't close these five refinances the way we were planning. My private money lender also says, Hey, I'm really concerned with what's going on in the markets right now. I'd like to get my private money back. Okay. So we've got hard money that's ticking where we, we're not going to be able to do this refinance like we thought. And we've got the private money involved there that now we need to repay and we're under the gun to repay that. There were, there were terms on that. None of the terms were expired on that private money, but we wanted to honor the lender because they took a chance on us. We had a good relationship with them and try to get them paid back as quick as we could. So we're, we're scrambling, right? We're like, okay, I, so, so we came up with, and y'all stop me if you want to ask questions. Um, well, I just want to know, did you end up going to the emergency room for hypertension? (laughs) This sounds like the perfect cocktail for (laughs) Oh, I tell you what, almost, almost made me want to go to the emergency room is when they closed the schools down. And I was like, okay, now my kids are at home. (laughs) My wife's running her business from home. I'm running my business from home and the kids are trying to run me out of my home. Yep. So it was, that was, uh, that was pure anarchy there. This is good. So, so if I understand you right, what you're saying is that you borrowed this money from hard money and from private money. Hard money is typically a little bit uh, more expensive than private money, but it comes with a more formalized payment structure. You usually have like at least a year to pay it back. It's predetermined interest. Private money is typically a little bit more loosey goosey for lack of a better term. That's a turn turn right there. You're you're borrowing it at goodwill, you're paying it back, but when they come to you and they say, hey, I want my money back, you probably don't have a note that's been written up that says, I get your money for this long. And even if you do, you feel bad, you wanna pay it back. To pay it back, you go to the bank to refinance into your long-term solution. And now they're telling you, we don't want to do that right now because we don't know if we'll be able to sell this note. So all this pressure is sitting right on top of your chest and you don't really have any way in the beginning to get it off. Right. That's exactly right. That's a, that's a good summary. And our, and our private money lender had seconds on all of our properties. So they had some collateral, but of course they don't want to foreclose on the property. That's not their, they're not in it to get the property. They're in it to just make a good return on their investment, get their money back. And, and we wanted them to have that outcome as well. So we're like, okay, what are we going to do? Okay. So first thing I thought was these five properties are already rented. We're just going to have to refinance those. That, that's our best option there. The, the other five properties, we had renovations going on. I said, we got to get these renovations finished as fast as possible. So I put the heat on our guys to get these renovations done. A lot of them were almost done. Um, and, and so we got those renovations finished quickly and we put those five properties up for sale. Okay. Those didn't have tenants in them. I'm like, we just need to dump these properties. That way this doesn't bleed us when we go to do the refinance. One property had three full price offers fall through. So we would go under contract. We're like, we're going to make 40 wow. grand on this. this 40, making 40 grand on a flip during the pandemic. That's, that's a home run for me. Yeah. It would, it, it, we, it'd be under contract for two or three weeks. Then it would fall through. They would say, the first person said, we're just too uneasy with the environment right now to close on this. They left. The second person went under contract um, two or three weeks and they said their mother died. We, we didn't we didn't ask any questions, just gave them their money back, said, we're sorry for your loss, but it was a huge bummer. The third one came in, took it under, got it under contract for two or three weeks, and then they bolted as well. For They didn't even tell us why. But I said, hey, I'm not putting this up for sale anymore. Like, this is wasting our time. We got to get these refinances done. This private money lender is going to, they need their money back. Second thing I thought of was, okay, another way to get rid of these properties, you know, quickly would be to wholesale them. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I called my wholesaler, my wholesaler that I bought a lot of stuff from. And I said, Hey, I got five deals. 
four of them are completely renovated, ready, ready for tenants. One of them has, we haven't started renovations on yet. We had just closed on this thing when the pandemic happened. And he said, okay, I'll, I'll take it to my boss to see what I can do. He took the one that had no renovations done on it. And he called me and said, I can't take these other four that are renovated. And I was like, why? Cause I mean, we'll give you a good deal on them. He said, I don't want to blast these out to my list and the people on my list get the impression that if they buy stuff from us at a discount and renovate it, that they're not going to be able to sell it. They're not going to be able to flip it. So the wholesaler wouldn't even take four of these Wow. and try to wholesale them. So I was like, I was surprised at that because I thought these are turnkey, like people will get a good deal on it. We just didn't want to have to go through the refi process. So anyway, the guy blasts the property we had out or that we had that wasn't renovated out to his list. Doesn't get any takers on it, even though it was, at a, it was a good deal. So we were like, okay, We've exhausted trying to sell these. We've exhausted the wholesaler route. We can't refinance them with our our first lender, so we're just gonna have to go through Fannie Mae. By the way, this just feels like you know, like every like Disney movie ever made, where it's like <laughs> this is like the part where the music's coming in. Like this is like one sucky like getting punched <laughs> in the gut after another. This is like Elsa <laughs> dying in Frozen Two. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know. Everyone's like, I haven't seen it yet. Brandon just ruined it. Yeah, it, she she's never comes back. It's, it's over. <laughs> Side note, uh, Brandon is totally validating the talk we had before the show about how when you become a parent, everything becomes about your children. He just, uh, how old are you now, Brandon? 36, 35? 34. 34. 34. And you just quoted Frozen 2 on the Bigger Pockets podcast. Well, I can tell you about gas prices there as well. <laughs> New Balance tennis shoes. Yeah, New Balance. Yeah, if you want to know about that okay. stuff. I got a really good dad joke I can leave you, you guys with, but let, let's, be let's keep going. Tip. So anyway, music's going. Everything's like, this is like the, the dark part of the hero's journey right now, mm. uh, which we talked about the hero's journey on a, on a recent show. This is, the, this is the, the depths of despair, right? This is when <laughs> Frodo gets wrapped up in that spider web, right? Remember like he gets like wet, wrapped in the spider, which coincidentally also happened on Trolls. Uh, Poppy gets wrapped up in a spider uh, web in Trolls. So you can take either the PG-13 example or the G example, depending think on the brand. Brandon wandering his way into the realm of analogies. Look <laughs> I, think, at this. I think the difference in trolls is that she like break, break dances her way out of it or something. That's you true. Know? And actually, so. technically, it was Branch that gets... Re- no, no, it was her. It was Poppy and Branch. Yeah, she... Yeah. There's okay, a lot more, I'm totally a lot more dancing. this rabbit trail. Just so I need oh, to bring oh, you back to a real lot estate. More, a lot more break dancing and happiness happened in trolls <laughs> than in Lord of the Rings. But, so tell us how you got out of the spider... You were wrapped in the spider web and the, and you were uh, getting eaten alive. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, so we've exhausted these, these first few options. So we're like, okay, we're going to have to refinance these through Fannie Mae. So we start this process and we're like, okay, we've already got 10 of these. And this is, this is an interesting thing that I've heard from a lot of investors. They have this perception that you can only do 10 properties through Fannie Mae. That is true for each individual. But if you're married, for instance, you can do 10 properties in your spouse's name as well. Yep. And so my partner and I, you know, we have the capacity to have 40 of these things. So then you start dancing around, you know, Fannie Mae, I think it's, I think it's properties one through five. They have different requirements than properties six through 10. So my partner and I had already had already basically uh, used up our numbers one through five. So we, we utilized our wives ability to have properties one through five and, and did our refinances through their names. So, um, so that's kind of how we've attacked this. So, and stop me if you got questions I'll keep uh, going as I go here, but Fannie Mae has a different requirement than our first lender. Fannie Mae's requirement was 75% loan to value. So we already got a lower loan to value requirement than this 80 that the other lender had on top of that. Fannie Mae has, um, as of the application on my loan, I don't know what's going on right now, but they've doubled the requirements for reserves. So, um, whereas it, oh. it was six months, now it's 12 months, 12 months of reserves. Yeah. Wow. 12 months of reserves. And so we have, I mean, it has been the most difficult loans we've ever closed, but we've been through this entire process and we just closed these loans, these refinances at 3.5% on a 30 year fixed conventional loans. And I mean, we, we pulled out all the stops and the way we're in, and you're probably wondering how much cash did you have to come up with to close these 10 deals? We had to come up with $200,000. Okay. Ooh. The interesting part about that is the closing costs on each deal on these 10 deals, the closing costs alone were 10,000 bucks. So there's a hundred thousand dollars of closing costs. Wow. You got to think like, okay, it's 75% loan to value on these properties are worth 2 million bucks. You got to be at 1.5 million. 
So we essentially built in from our bird, our bird deal, we built in $400,000 of equity and we had to put hundred K in ourselves. Let me see if I can piece some of this together. Cause this is really, really good stuff. You had 10 deals that you thought you were going to get 80% loan to value on. You only got 75% loan to value when you finally found a lender. So that means you're not able to get as much out as you thought. Meaning instead of getting all of your capital out, you left $200,000 in over 20 properties, correct? That's correct. And that's about 20 grand a property. So let's reduce that's it correct. to per house because that's easier to understand. Of that 20 grand that you left in, 10,000 of it was a closing cost. That's correct. For that property. So 50% of the capital that you left in the deal was actually the closing cost that you needed to refinance, you're saying. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. So what would you say on average each of these properties is going to cash flow? With the extra cash we put in because they're at 75% loan to value instead of 80, mm -hmm. each one's cash flowing like th th uh, three to $350 a property. That's net of all net of all operating expenses. So that means that if you left 20 grand in each property and you said you're cash flowing between 300 and 400 a property, is that about right? That's correct. Okay, I'm just doing some quick math in my head. You're probably at around a 36 to 48% ROI on each of these properties that we are considering a failure because you weren't able to get out 100% of your equity. And in addition to a 48% ROI on each of these properties, you also gain $400,000 of equity. So well, here's what I love about this story. A, we're gonna get into it more. It went badly. This is like a perfect storm of what are the odds that this COVID-19 would hit, it would affect lending the way it did, your private money guy would want his money back, all these things, they just, you got hammered. You got hit with a flurry of Mike Tyson punches here, okay? <laughs> And you walked out of that with $400,000 in equity, a 48% return on your money. If it wasn't for closing costs being so high, which you probably wouldn't have had them that high if you didn't have to go with this lender because you were just up that creek and you had no chance, your ROI would be even higher because 50% of the capital that you left in was actual closing cost capital. Um, you, you essentially traded 200 grand for 400, 200 grand of cash for 400 grand of equity and a 48% return on your money. This yeah. sounds like when one of those like NBA executives trades a star player <laughs> and they get back four first round draft picks and three second round draft picks and they turn that into four Hall of Famers over a long period of time. And this is on a deal that went bad. Okay. What you called the perfect burr, which I think um, I'm going to try my hand at being Brandon Turner and call it perfect. Like you just completely crush it and you get all your capital back. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. <laughs> well, that's when it goes perfectly. That's what we what we tend to hold up as like what we expect. Okay. If I did it, if I didn't get all of it back, I did it wrong. But what you're showing us is that's gonna be David's new book. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. We sh if you guys want to give me suggestions on what this new perfect uh, novel should be about, send them in and I'll see if I can get that push that through. Uh, if you could go back in time and say, would you rather do this deal where you get all these numbers or not? You probably would have said, yep, I will do that. It's still a great Absolutely. return. Yeah. Okay. And here, let me, let me add one more layer to this of silver lining in the storm cloud. Okay. I, last night I, I built out a spreadsheet and I wanted to see how much interest we were saving by being forced to go this other route. Cause we were ready to close with this other lender. And over 30 years, because we're at 3.5% instead of 5.5%, we're saving $750,000 in interest. Wow. So that, that goes straight to the bottom line. So in my mind, not only did we have to cough up 200 to, to build in another 400 of equity, but we coughed up 200 to generate an extra 750,000 in profit over the life of these things. So yeah. It's not all bad. I mean, the, the money, like the like the loan to value requirement of 75% by Fannie Mae forced us to put a little extra money in the property, but the things are cash flowing better and we're saving a ton of money and interest over the life of the loan. So that's the good part about all this. Hey, Josiah, what was your mindset like during all this? Like when, wh like, were you always pretty upbeat? Like, ah, you know, we're going to figure this out or were you... You have some sleepless nights. The craziest part about all this is it's been really exhilarating for me. And I've, I've in a very strange way enjoyed this because to me, real estate is it's, it's basically just an exercise in solving problems. Yep. Some of them are small. Some of them are very complex and complicated and, and drawn out. Right. And you feel like you're just getting a life beaten out of you. But I've always thought like, if you're willing to stick with it and you're willing to keep working on the problem, you can figure out 
the crack in the in the rock and get through there, right? So, like when our when our lender said, okay, we're not refinancing these, and then the private money lender called and said, we want our money back. And then we couldn't sell these things. I'm like, okay, great, man. This is like the perfect storm. But, you know, we kept at it. We kept at it. And then we had a rock star lender that helped us pull off these refinances. And he said, that was the craziest. Those were the craziest sets of refinances I've ever done because of the timing of this and just what's going on in the market. You know, he said, but we did it. We figured it out. And so, like, honestly, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun. It's It's been definitely been hard and challenging at times, but... Like this to me, if you're willing to do this stuff, you're going to win eventually. You got to just got to hang on. You know what I mean? So, well, part of what I think is really insightful about your story is when you were getting the news that we're not going to refinance your properties at 80% loan to value. And oh, by the way, just say, I want my money back. I'm really scared. Everyone's freaking out. And oh, by the way, this is now you can't sell your house. You could not see the solution that you're going to end up right now. It was it was hidden from you. You could not see it. I'm sure Brandon can point out that at some point in Frodo's journey, he could also not see that an elf was coming to save him at some point. But that doesn't mean it's not there, right? Like it's so easily to get discouraged and overwhelmed by negative emotions and tell yourself horrible things like real estate investing is stupid. I never should have done this. I should go back to my cubicle and dancing with the stars never let me down. But if you just keep pushing, the answers come. And as we see, the answers were really not that bad at all. That if you had had a heart attack at that time, that'd have been really sad because now you're probably actually excited with how these deals worked out. Yeah, absolutely. And and also I looked at the stock market. The stock market's crashing. And I'm like, I haven't lost any money. Mm -hmm. I, I've just got money invested that you know we weren't necessarily planning on. And and to go back to how we came up with the money, you may be thinking, how'd you come up with 200000 bucks? We had money in reserves. We didn't have that much money in reserves. And we had kept one property completely paid for that we that we we talked about long before this happened. You don't get your highest, you know, cash on cash return or return on investment by having a property that's paid for. But what that is is that's insurance, that's reserves in the case that some kind of black swan crazy thing, crazy event happens, we can tap into that money and that will save us. So we did a cash out refinance on one of those properties and that's the money that we used here. Oh, and so, that's good. yeah. And so that's what, that's what ultimately got us through this. Here's what I love about that. You're not asking the question, should I pay my properties off or should I max out leverage as much as possible? Like most people do. That's how that debate typically gets presented. Should you pay everything off or should you over leverage everything that you possibly can? Right. You recognize that there's a balance. I want to be leveraged, but I also need a couple paid off so that in a worst case scenario event, I feel safe. And what do you know? Lo and behold, I don't think I've ever said lo and behold. Is lo that and behold. That I've yeah, known? that's a, such a dad. That's like a grandpa <laughs> phrase right there. You're officially <laughs> a, a dad now, David. Yeah. 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 Like yeah. A, it's an uncle lo phrase. Lo and behold. <laughs> lo and behold, the gas up the streets one penny cheaper. Yes. And I can <laughs> take the front of the road to get there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what you did was you said, I'm going to have a property or two or three or whatever paid off with a line of credit that I can tap into in case I need it. And you did need it. And you were able to use it in order. This is the irony. You used the paid off property in order to save the leverage property. So you did what millionaires do. You said, how can I have both? You didn't look at it from this um, this dichotomy of it's it's polarized one or the other. There's It's a binary way of looking at it. Should I burr or should I flip? Should I go all in or should I never put anything down on any property at all? You used a combination of the strategies like Brandon talks about all the time, having these tools in your tool belt so that you went in there with a screwdriver and when you realized you needed a saw, you had one. And that's what we tell people that you should do when you're investing in real estate. You're a perfect case study in how this works is all these what if, well, what if that happens? What if this happens? It never happened. Well, they actually happened with you and you still survived it because you were prepared. It's not easy to, to basically have a property that you know is not giving you the highest cash on cash return or and your ROI isn't maximized, maximized. But when you think, okay, what could put me out of the game? And it's always reserves, right? It's always like lack of lack of capital when needed. That's what puts businesses out. That's what put, puts real estate investors out. And so you got to have that dry powder somewhere. And I look at Warren Buffett, right? He's He's the king of this. He's got billions of dollars sitting on the sidelines, even when things are good. You're like, why is he doing that? He could be buying all these stocks. Well, when things crash, he starts buying up stuff. And consequently, I looked and I read an article on Warren Buffett yes or day before yesterday. Berkshire Hathaway lost something like five or fifty, fifty billion dollars or something like that. 
And so like, you know, when Warren Buffett's losing $50 billion, something's going wrong in the economy. And like, this isn't just real estate investors getting hit. This is everybody, you know? So this is just trying to figure out how to get through this kind of thing. Yeah, it's true. So let's talk about what other people should be doing right now or potentially. I mean, obviously, you know, everyone's situation is unique, but should people, do you think, and I'll ask both of you this question right now, here we are recording this, what, early May 2020, should people right now be burring or buying properties with the intention to burr? David, you want to go first? Do you want me to jump in? No, I want you to go first because okay. I spent the last 30 minutes basically telling everyone why your story is great. So <laughs> I think my opinion has kind of been put out there. I, I'll, I'll say this. You know, it, I, I guess it depends on your situation. If you're in a situation where you've got a lot of highly leveraged properties, then I would say, you know, it's a time to work through what you got going on. If you've like, I've got some friends that got a lot of cash and they've told me a number of times they want to invest in real estate. And they, and I've even heard them say, I want to wait until there's a dip in the market. So I'm thinking, why aren't you buying stuff right now? You know? Um, and it was interesting when we tried to sell these properties, I called some people that had cash that don't have properties and tried to sell them to those people. And they looked at them, but they wouldn't buy them. And like, to me, that's a perfect time to jump in on something like that. Yeah. But I would say with the caveat that you got to have reserves and you also need to make sure and back into your numbers and knowing that Fannie Mae is going to cap you out at 75%, I would want to try to be in these things for like 65% or yeah. something like that. You know, just get more conservative on your numbers when you're running your numbers and you can still make it work. What I would say about should I buy now or should I wait as opposed to is right now a good time to burr? Well, the first philosophy is you can always buy if you live beneath your means and you have a good amount of reserves. That's just period. You take so much stress off yourself trying to time the market when you're in that position where you can endure whatever flurry of attack comes at you. The second thing is there's this philosophy that you don't want to be the one to catch the falling knife. So what that means is when the market is tanking, you don't want to jump in early. You want to, you'd rather almost jump in late, wait for the knife to go hit the ground and bounce up. And that's when you would, you know, that's when you jump in. It's better to go a little bit higher than you could have if you timed it perfectly than it is to jump in early and end up getting hurt. But Everybody ran to that during this COVID thing. Like, oh, the economy shut down. We have record or unemployment. We're plunging into a depression. Don't buy anything. They assumed this is a falling knife. And I never, I still haven't really quite bought into that. We're into a depression right now. And part of it's where I live, right? We all have different experiences, what we see. But in the Bay Area, I'll tell you, I have a listing that we took off the market when the, the shutdown happened because the seller just said, hey, I think I just want to wait. While... Like we just had out here in the Bay Area, we just had our shelter in place extended for another month, but we knew there was a chance it might be lifted at the beginning of this month. While waiting, we just with the sign in the front yard, I've had three people ask to go see that house just based off the sign in the yard or agents that have been searching for withdrawn listings because there's so little inventory and so much demand that they're looking for houses that are not on the market to try to show their clients because they can't get anything that yeah. is on the market. This is in the middle of record unemployment and a huge shutdown and the sky is falling and everything's going terrible. And I'm now getting three offers on this property that's technically not even listed right now as active on the MLS. And it's gonna go for way over asking price. Had somebody jumped in and bought that property when it was first on the market, when everyone was like, oh, I don't know, I'm gonna wait and see what's happened. They would have saved around $40,000 for what it's gonna sell for right now. That is a perfect example of this does not feel like a falling knife whatsoever. Now, I may eat my words. We may have something worse happen and the economy does plunge into a depression. I just don't think that's going to happen. I think we're all going to go back to work and the economy is going to come back really strong and people are going to start buying houses again. And as long as there's stability with employment, they're going to keep buying. But the question of should I buy now or not is largely it largely depends on your personal situation. Is your job stable? If it's not, it's probably not a good time for you to buy a house. If your personal financial situation is not rock solid, this is, that's usually not a good idea to do. And the second is geographical. What is your market like? If you live where I live, a lot of people are working from home. These tech jobs, you can work from anywhere. We're not suffering very much. But maybe where Josiah is is different. The point I wanted to make is that when you had this opportunity to buy these houses and wholesalers didn't want them, it looks now from where we're standing like that was the best time to buy something. That you had that very small window when everyone was scared when you could get a really good deal and as consumer confidence comes back when your individual confidence comes back with it you're now with the herd everybody feels that way you're now competing with all those same people to get the few number of deals that are out there is that what you're seeing too that's what i'm i mean that's what i'm seeing like uh you know our properties are predominantly in in fort worth texas they've lifted the stay-at-home order there 
So there's there's still some, you know, I don't know that they've 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 not opened everything up wide open, but you know, when we went when we had these 10 properties, five of them weren't rented. We got those things renovated and rented in record time. I've never had properties rent so fast as these properties rented. So there is a there is a good demand for rental properties right now in that market in DFW. I can't speak for all over the United States. Sure. My theory is I was like, why, why are these renting out so fast? We had high quality tenants too. My theory is maybe, maybe a people don't want to stay in apartments as much. They want space or B since we have B class properties, maybe these a class tenants are trying to get a discount, save some money that's trickling down to B class. And a lot of these, a lot of the the tenants that are filling these B class properties Mm. have high quality jobs. They haven't lost their jobs, but they feel a little bit safer getting a little bit cheaper of a home. That's right. And, and we collected, you know, Thank God we collected all of our rent in March and all of our rent in April. No one missed a payment. And one thing I wanted to add is that we have 20 properties. Two two separate tenants had to end their lease at the end of April because of domestic violence. And so you've read about domestic violence being up. We've seen that with our tenants. Two, wow. different, two different tenants had someone in their household threaten to kill them and had to break their lease because of that. And so, hmm. you know, this stuff is, this stuff is real. Like people having to being stuck at home and, and people, you know, being affected, like it's, it's, it's the real deal. So, I mean, it's actually domestic violence thing is, is real when you're seeing those statistics. We had two of those tenants um, have to leave because of that, but you know, wow. everyone is, everyone is paid. So we've been very thankful for that. If, if you go on my Instagram, you can see Brandon and I's domestic violence. When I was at, with his place in Hawaii, we actually got into a fight on his front yard and Ryan Murdoch. <laughs> videotaped the entire excellent thing. excellent i don't know yeah. if that was much of a fight as much as you were crying and i was on top of you just <laughs> punching your face he was and... doing that thing where he takes my hand and he hits me with yeah. it and he says stop punching yourself <laughs> yeah yeah, yourself, yourself. 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 Yep. yeah. Hey, yeah. so brandon i like what josiah just said is very similar to how you have sort of formed open door capital where you have recognized hey if the economy is going to get bad i don't want to be at the top of the chain when everything's moving down i want to be at the bottom where it's all coming and you've been kind of buying these mobile home parks. What have you been seeing as far as rent being paid, rent not being paid, challenges that have come up during the crisis? Yeah, we hit almost across 600 units. We hit almost 100 percent. We had like 97 or 98 percent rent collected in April. Here we are now in May. Uh, we're recording this on the May 4th, the Star Wars Day. Uh, and as of yesterday, we already had in my personal, not my mobile home parks. That's a little bit slower to report to me. But in my personal collection of like the 25 units roughly I have in Washington, we're already at 90 some percent collected, and we're not even at the fifth yet. Like I don't think we've ever actually been this far ahead. So I'm I'm seeing a lot of positive sign for May as well. Obviously, when this episode comes out, we're well into May, and so uh, you know, hopefully, I'm not eating my words there. But yeah, overall, I'm I'm pretty optimistic. What I, about with your flip? Yeah. Have you seen values changing on your Maui flip? Uh, inventory is down dramatically uh, because everyone's pulling their listings in Maui. I mean, I think Maui's going to be hit harder than most places in the world, um, just because no one like no one's moving here. But uh, like no one, no, I shouldn't say no one's moving here. My my uh, one of my team members, Mike, just moved here last week. Uh, but he has a fourteen day. Like if you move here, you have to. If you come here, you have a fourteen day. You can't leave your house for fourteen days. Like they lock you in quarantine. Like you cannot yeah. leave. In fact, yeah. Anyway. Crazy. So I think Maui's going to be a little bit slower coming back. So I'm, I'm 50, 50 on whether I'm going to have to rent that or sell it, but we'll see. There's not much inventory. So like my house is going to be the cheapest and one of the only houses on the market. So and, the, and a lot of people buy fun. Maui real estate from outside of Maui. That's Correct. another thing yep. to think about, right? Their economy is what makes their decision it has nothing to do with what's happening Correct. in Hawaii. Yeah. For context, we put three house hackers under contract last week. And I put two listings under contract, both for over asking price. So there's yeah. zero indication that anything where I am is, it's it's slowing down to the point where if you've been thinking about buying, this is a great time to get in because the competition isn't as crazy as it was, but we're not seeing prices drop. I mean, houses have to sit on the market for a long time before that happens. And that's not- I have an all. analogy. Hmm. This is good. And it's not a Disney one. It's a Warner <laughs> Brothers one. So, do you remember Wiley e. Coyote? I was chasing the the what's it called Road the, the Road Roadrunner, Runner, right? Yeah. And you'd always like run off a cliff, and then he would like stay in midair. And there's like <laughs> below him is just a a, a cl- but he didn't cliff. know it until he looked down. He right? didn't know it until he looked down, right? And then he fell. But he could like if they'll say the cliff was a hundred feet across, he could have just run right across that cliff and made it to the other side of the cliff, right? It's only like if this thing goes on for six months, we will all realize we're on a cliff and we're all going to fall. But if not, we're just going to run right over the cliff and not even realize that they're like, I mean, in other words, like the market, I think, I think I'm with you, David. I think that if this ends soon, 
house prices will just like you know like inventory uh will go back to where it was before price will go back to where it was before because like it's gonna be like oh wow that was scary <laughs> yep but we're on the other mm-hmm. side now we're fine we're like we're past it but yeah i don't like the fear is if this continues that's when it starts you're like oh yeah shoot we're standing over midair, and that's when we're gonna collapse. Pretty good, like a uh, scale good. one to ten. How was that on a on a analogy? I, that's meter? like a nine and a half. Right. I thought that was solid. <laughs> ten, right. solid ten. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, let me make a point, bringing it back to what we talked about a minute ago. But I wanted to make this one thing when we talk about no money, and we talk about burr investing, we talk about creative investing, we talk about using partners and hard money and all of that. This is the point that I make in the book uh, that we released a few years ago, the book on investing with no and low money down. And we have a second edition coming out soon. And I make the point again in here. Investing with no money down is not about having no money, right? So like, this is why you survived, Josiah, this difficulty because you, you had the equity in your property. You knew you could tap, you had something there you could tap into. A lot of people, like, they're just broke. I mean, just nothing whatsoever. And they can't even put food on their table. They're like, well, I'm going to get into real estate and try to do this for no money now. Now, there are strategies. You can go and partner with somebody maybe or be like the boots on the ground for somebody. But just understand, like, the reason, the way you survive difficulties when you're doing more aggressive or, or uh, you know, creative financing is by having some financial resource to you. So if you don't have that, just go find somebody you can partner with that does have it. But uh, don't put yourself in a stupid position where you're just like, well, I got no money whatsoever, no credit, no ability to get anything. And now I've got all these loans and now I'm going to be screwed. In fact, if you think about no money down investing it on its face, it does sound riskier. But would you rather have the money in the property as equity where you have zero control over what happens? So when the property value drops, your money disappears. Or would you rather have that money out of the property in your bank account where it stays safe and you can use it to pay rent when your tenants aren't paying and to pay your expenses when you need it or to buy a property, right? Like you're you're kind of taking it out of the area that you can't control it when you leave it as equity and putting it in an area where you can control it when you put it in your bank account. Is that the same way you say it, Brandon? Yes, exactly. Reserves are everything. And just like, just like in a business, you know, I mean, if you got no money in the bank and something happens, you can't, you can't make payroll. You know, it's like, you got to have, got to have the reserves there. And, you know, this thing could have gone a lot worse. You know, fortunately these, these appraised where they did and we didn't screw the burr up as well and have to come to the table with three or $400,000 to close $2 million of properties. You know, it could have been, could have been much worse. So let me ask you this. Are you still looking to buy? So, so my goal has been, so, so my partner in my goal has been to have, 20 properties, about 4 million bucks in real estate investment properties in one to four family. And then my goal this whole time has been to move into multifamily from here. So my goal right now is to get all this stuff taken care of, get through this time. And then I'm going to start trying to hack away at doing apartment deals. So that's my, that's where I'm headed. You know, I love your strategy and I loved it when we interviewed you on the other episode that came out yesterday. And we talked about how you brought in the private money lender to fund Kind of like almost like the down payment, essentially, but like the chunk that the hard money lender wouldn't finance. I love that strategy. Looking back at the situation now and how this went, do you still like that strategy? And then also as a counter or another half of that question, what would you do differently now to be maybe more clear or to have a more like like where were you where were you take your uh, a, a relationship with a private lender uh, differently now than you did before based on what happened? So yeah, would you do it? And then what would you do differently if so? You know, it helped us so much to to work with the private money lender. I, I don't think I would do anything differently other than maybe try to have maybe a, a more clear set of of parameters around that money. Um, and like I said, we had a we had a term to it, but I didn't really feel like I had a lot of leverage to say no when they said they wanted their money back. Right. Yep. I mean, it's you kind of feel like you took a chance on me. You felt me like I need to do right by you and get your money back as fast as I can. So. I would just say, um, just to be cautious with that, but I mean, I guess, you know, in hindsight, the, the best thing to do would be to be much more conservative with your burr numbers, try to have all your burr deals done at 60, 65% loan to value. Then on your refi, you're not, not having to come to the table with money, but you know, again, like as an appraiser on the back end of this, the X factor in all this is your appraisal value. And these, these deals, we got these deals appraised with the first lender they appraised for X. So we got them appraised with a second lender, the Fannie Mae deal. And it, it appraised for, they appraised for about five to 10% less. So that also hurt us, you know, and that was a temporary dip just because the market, you know, people were putting properties on the market and um, discounting the prices and stuff. And I think the appraisers were being conservative because they don't want to yep. ha- have some foreclosures that they did appraisals on that somebody comes back and sues them later, you know? So that, that was another factor in this, 
But I would say, yeah, private money, I think private money is a great way to go. And I think it can really open the whole thing up, you know, for you as an investor. But I would just say like, you know, be very clear, have a lot of detail around your, your, um, your commitments with private money lenders and that kind of thing. What what are your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. And I think that this is where in, in, this is where attorneys come in really, really handy. And I'm not saying you have to go sit down with an attorney if you're going to borrow private money necessarily. But here, here's a good example. So one time, uh, this is like a couple years ago. You guys have probably heard the story before. But I bought a, a big mobile home park, not big, it's like 50 units, in Bangor, Maine with uh, Ryan Murdoch, who now runs, uh, you know, helps run Open Door Capital. Uh, and also Mindy Jensen, who's the host of the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, and her husband, Carl. So the, the, the three of us, or four of us, you know, partnership, or I mean, a married couple and the two of us, bought this property and we sat down with an attorney with a, an attorney in in Bangor who helped us work through the what ifs the if this went wrong what do you, if this goes wrong guys what are you going to do if this happens what are you going to do if this and like he asked so many I mean we sat for an hour on this call with him and he probably asked 50 questions of if this happens what are you going to do and a lot of times it was like I, I didn't even know that was a possibility I didn't know I had to be a, a, worried about that but like that's where a good attorney can come in really handy if you're partnering or you're bringing in private money because then you've had those conversations like, what do we do if the market does tank? What do we do if we can't pay this back in time? Then you have those conversations. They get worked into an operations agreement and then hopefully things like fear and emotion don't cause private lenders or partners to suddenly react and try to pull their money back. And I'm not saying that's exactly what your person did, but I've had that happen before. And I was in the same, I'm a nice guy. You're a nice guy. We want to be nice to people. And so even if like the contract says one thing and they're like, Oh, I just want my money back. We're going to give them their money back if at all possible. Uh, but it makes it less likely when you have things really officially done. Like attorneys already gone over it. Here's the paperwork. It says right here. They may not even ask then at that point because they just know that it was so officially done. So anyway, that's sure. just my two cents. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, our private money lender, we, uh, I guess another layer of complication on all this is we had 10 deals. Some of them, the private money was almost up the term. Yep. And the private money lender wasn't going to renew it. Sure. Right. So, and, and the private money lender didn't say, hey, I'm foreclosing on you if you don't give me my money tomorrow. It was more of just, I want my money back. I can't renew these for you things are bad in, in the market. Like we, I need to get this back ASAP. So it, it, it lit a fire under us to go figure out how to get this money back to him and paid off, you know? So, well, cool guys. All right. Well, let's see before we get out, you know, kind of move on. I mean, this show's gonna be a little bit shorter probably than our usual ones. And we're probably not going to repeat the, all, all the, you know, the deal deep dive, uh, fire round, et cetera. I, I want to do a couple more, just kind of more general questions though, that we didn't get to last time that I had written down to ask you last time. Sure. Uh, a first one, greatest day of your investing life, worst day of your investing life. <laughs> greatest day of my investing life. Or like what memory just makes you smile and honestly, what memory makes uh, you shake uh, a little bit? Honestly, the greatest day of my investing life was signing the documents to close these refinances right now. Yeah. Just because it was like, this is the, this is the most complex problem that's been thrown at us and we got through it, you know, and it's not over yet. I mean, all kinds of stuff can happen from here. But just literally getting them refinanced over to Fannie Mae, and the reason we're so happy to have them over there, if our tenants stop paying us, which they haven't done yet, mm -hmm. but if they do stop paying us, Fannie Mae will work with you. Yeah. This other lender we had, the private money lender, the the um, the hard money lender, that's they don't have that same set of rules, so they're not required to to give you forbearance on your loans if that happens. So now we have, now we've moved these over. Now we're working with Fannie Mae, which is a much different thing. So. That was probably like, I feel like I've accomplished something by getting all the, you know, working through all this. Um, wor worst, worst day as an investor was probably, I, I would say probably in the middle of this whole thing that's happened recently when, when the flip, the full price flip fell through for the third time. And I, I just gotten off the phone with my private money lender saying, we're not renewing you. We need our money back. And then the initial lender said, we won't close you. And it's like, okay, nothing's working right now. Yeah. You know? And it's like, okay, I got to figure this out. So it, it, it's all been pretty recent. All these, these highs and lows, it's been a roller coaster. So. All right. Next question. How has your real estate journey been different than what you imagined? You know, we didn't plan to do the burst strategy and be coming out of pocket with the money we have. Um, that being said, you know, we've, we've created about, you know, we have a portfolio of 4 million and we've, you know, by my estimation, we have about 1.2 million in equity. So it's been a, I feel like it's been a big success. It's just not been the, the, 
you know, the, the Burr strategy, there's a lot of money in closing costs. There's a lot of money in holding costs. And then the appraisal is the X factor. You could get two appraisers to appraise the same property. One will come in 10 grand higher than the other. And you're, you're coming out of pocket with money based on which appraiser you ended up with. So, um, so sometimes you don't completely burr out of your deals and you have to be okay with saying, okay, I'm leaving this 5k or 10k in this property because my cash on cash is what I, what I want it to be. This property is going to appreciate. It's being paid off. There's a lot of benefit, the tax benefits, that kind of thing. Yeah. But it's important to point out that you're not making the decision of, do I want to leave 5k or 10k in a property or not? It's, do I want to leave 5k or 10k in a property with a burr that didn't go perfect? Or do I want to leave 45k in a property using the traditional method. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So even when it doesn't go right, it's still usually or almost always better than the alternative would have been. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, like on average, I would say if we've left 10k in a property, there's 60k of equity there. So that's yeah. a win. That's a win. You know, I mean, and I bring could, that up because yeah. that's the criticism you hear of Burr. Well, what if this goes wrong, and what if that goes wrong, and and it's always phrased like if something goes wrong and it's not perfect, you shouldn't have done it. But those problems happen when you buy a house without doing the Burr method. When you just put a whole bunch down and then spend a bunch on the rehab, you have the same issue. You just leave more money in the deal than a Burr that goes wrong. Yeah. And I also, I mean, I, I you know, to use an appraisal term, what, what's your what's your your highest and best use of that money? So what what's your opportunity cost, right? If you could put, like if you ask somebody, if you put 10K in this, and it were and it were worth 60k but you couldn't sell it immediately would you be okay with that most people would say yeah I'll jump all over that well that's what's happening on these bird deals sometimes you're putting 10k in you created 60k of equity and oh by the way this thing when it's paid off is going to be worth half a million bucks a million bucks so you put 10k in you're going to get a million dollars out you just did you just paid 100 times your money on that 10k or you could put it in the stock market and you might get 8% a year and run run the future value on that that might turn into you know, 25,000, 30,000. I don't know. So like your opportunity cost of taking this 10 K and turning it into 500,000, your opportunity cost is taking that 10 K and getting 8% a year and turning it into 25 or 30,000. It's a ma- massive difference, you know? So it's such a good point. Yeah. You're not losing by putting the money in. You're actually, it's actually a great way to, to go about doing things. It's not necessarily the goal, but it's not a, it's not a loss. It's such an important thing for everyone listening to remember when you compare a possible outcome versus the perfect outcome, it is very easy to look at it and see the downside and say, this is why I shouldn't act. When you compare this possible outcome of I might leave 10K in a deal versus, well, what if I put that money in the stock market? It becomes very clear that this is a really good move. This 10K now could become a million later, $100,000 later. If I just wait, it's not going to do that anywhere else. That data that you bring into the the algorithm in your brain affects the gut feeling that you get that helps you make the decision of where you want to move. And that's what I'm always telling people is it's not just about, should I do this or should I not do this? It's about, well, what other options do I have? Let's look at the four different options that I have. And then I'll, then usually the right one will become clear. And that's how you win at the real estate game. You are patient. You get rich slow. You consistently make smart financial decisions to keep your personal finances low and put the extra capital you do have into real estate. You do that as efficiently as possible, which Burr helps you do and investing with other people can help you do. And then you just wait for inflation to do its its job and, you know, renters to pay your mortgage off for you. And then you look really smart. You know, some people might think, oh, you had to put some cash in this. You know, I I would, I would do the same thing all over again because of what this, what this, these properties are going to turn into value wise when they're paid off. To me, it's still a great investment. Yeah, well, if you put that same 200k into the stock market, would you have got 400k of equity? No, no you wouldn't. No. Would you be getting a 48% ROI? No, you wouldn't. Would you have nearly as much control over what happened? Would you be able to refinance later if the values go up and you can get Fannie Mae financing or or that other lender will let you refinance again? In fact, the people I know that invested in the stock market, they've been taking this a whole lot worse than real estate investors. Exactly. Have. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I would be I would be much more nervous about my 200K if I put it in the stock. I'd be on there checking it all the time, yeah. being like, oh no, is it going to dip down? To, I just lost 20 grand. You know, like that's the thing I don't like about the stock market. It's, fl- it's flashing a price in your face constantly. You're having to manage your emotions of the roller coaster ride. Yeah. Whereas in real estate, it's not flashing a price in your face constantly. You can put your 10K in that property, your 20K in there, and ride it out, make it through, and then sell that thing, and it's worth four or $500,000, you know, and, and, and you can manage your emotions better. That's what, that's what I love about real estate. So true. 
All right, last question before we start to wrap things. What can people listening to this show, how can they bring you value? What are you looking for right now? What do you need right now? Uh, what kind of value can people provide to you if they want to? Yeah, I want to start buying apartments. So, I mean, if you've got an apartment deal you're you're wanting to do and you want some partners to help you, you know, manage the whole process and raise money and and that kind of thing, I would love to partner up with you. So, yeah, I I want to get into multifamily investing. I also love mobile home parks, but um but Brandon's Brandon's your man on that. So. <laughs> I own I own it. <laughs> I own it. I have a I have a patent on it actually. So just by using the word mobile home park, you owe me thirty dollars. So thank oh, you. Oh, what, what's your what's your term? What's your phrase? <laughs> I, I don't I don't have one. Okay, in, in there in there another term that people use for mobile home parks that like uh, some, trailer parks. Over, tra- no, tra- yeah, we trailer don't call we don't call them yeah, trailer parks. Yeah, we don't parks. call we them trailer them parks. That's mobile no, no. home communities, gentlemen. There we go. They are mobile home communities. Eminem grew up in a trailer housing. park in Eight Mile. Brandon Turner invests in mobile home communities. Manufactured housing <laughs> communities. Manufactured home. There that's you know, the next. Le- that's the next level up. <laughs> anyway. All right, dude. Well, this has been awesome. Uh, of course, uh, you can listen. Everyone, go back and listen to yesterday's show if you didn't, which would be kind of weird to listen in reverse, but it would still make it would still make sense. You'd enjoy it. And uh, Josiah goes through his famous four and all that there. So we'll we'll leave that there. Uh, I, I am cur- curious, though. I know I said the last question, but any uh, any books or anything you've been consuming the last month since we recorded the other episode or a couple months? Anything oh, you recommend? I'm, I'm I'm always reading. Uh, let me look over here and. Let's see. I mean, I, I talked about some on the last podcast, but of course, you know, highly recommend everybody read Rich Dad Poor Dad. If you listen to this podcast, I hadn't read that. I don't know how you're sleeping at night, but um, <laughs> I'm you know big C.S. Lewis fan. Screw ta- screw tape le- screw tape letters, and um, trying to think of a. I've been reading the Four Hour Body by Tim Ferriss. I don't mm-hmm. know if y'all read that, but it's uh, being stuck at home and it's been a while, but yes, yeah, being stuck at home and trying to figure out the whole workout thing has been challenging. So, oh, dude, I got <laughs> I, this is like stupid uh toy purchase but i bought an oculus quest you know like the uh-huh. virtual reality goggles like yeah oculus and like i'm obsessed with it this is like the funnest like invention ever but the workout programs in it are like phenomenal like really? they're so fun and like you get done you're like just dripping sweat because like i'm like you don't even realize like you're fighting things that are coming at you and doing but really what you're doing is like squats lunges like jumping, hitting, like, yeah, it's crazy. So you get like a massive workout. It's been like, you know, 45 minute workout and you're just sweating. And the whole thing was a game. Uh, I would highly recommend anybody stuck at home that wants to work out, pick up, uh, it's like 600 bucks, but an Oculus Quest is a wow. well worthwhile investment. Have you like yeah. knocked over lamps in your house and like hit the wall? Uh, they do a pretty stuff, good job. You, you create like a, a fence around where oh, you okay. are. Yeah. It's, it's actually really cool technology. Like you, it's, it's like 20 years from now, we're going to back back and be, it's going to feel like Nintendo, you know, like how horrible <laughs> the graphics were. But like today you're like, this is, this is pretty incredible. So I'm picturing yeah. the kid on YouTube with the lightsaber, like swinging the kid yeah, the it's lightsaber out of the garage. Yeah. The Star Wars game is pretty yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. It's like you, like you literally are holding a lightsaber and you feel like you're holding the lightsaber and your mind like, it's like, this can't be real, but I'm holding a lightsaber in my hand and I'm fighting bad guys with it. It's crazy. Yeah. This, anyway. this uh, shelter in place has turned Brandon full Frodo. <laughs> he he's gone <laughs> from Lord of the Rings and exercising with a lightsaber. I've never saw. Oh. I never thought I'd see this side of Brandon. I think it's hilarious that you live in Maui and you're looking at like this virtual thing to take you to other places. <laughs> like I need to escape my reality. Ma- That's because we can't Maui. go to the we can't go to the beach. <laughs> you can't go anywhere, dude. If Brandon's beard were gray, it'd be Gandalf beard. I man. know. That That's like, epic. He's half a step away, bro. If this lasts for another month, we're going to see. <laughs> Brandon's going to change you his Instagram name. You shall not pass. Brandon, just get the hat, man. Get the hat. Dye I'll the beard gray it. for Halloween. It'd be awesome. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Okay, Josiah, for people that want to reach out to you to talk about investing in apartments or all the other stuff that you do, where's the best place to get a hold of you? Yeah, so I'm I'm on Instagram at Daily Real Estate Investor. That's a great place to connect. Um, shoot me a direct message on there. Uh, my email address is also on there. You can email me. And uh, I'd love for you to check out a copy of my book, Dream It and Build It, How to Crush the Real Estate and How to Crush Your Real Estate Investing Goals. Um, that's on Amazon and stuff. And I talked about that on the last episode. But yeah, I'd love to connect with anybody um, in this world and who's looking to do apartment deals. Awesome, man. Thank you. David Green, you want to take us out? Yep. This is David Green for Brandon Don't Look Down Turner signing off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.